Conrad, that is a very nice jacket you are wearing. Well, thank you, Guy. I, uh, you know, I had this jacket when I had my motorcycle, which I bought right when I graduated from Michigan. And then it disappeared about two months before I got married. I still, my wife is under suspicion, remains under suspicion of that. But I, I, I really haven't pulled out the Harley Davidson jacket for a long time until this conference. I am in Savannah, Georgia, a beautiful, beautiful city uh, at the motorcycle, first ever motorcycle accident conference. And bluntly, it's been a bit of a breath of fresh air, different because there's just a topical difference in general to uh, the typical marketing conferences that you and I spend so much time at. I and saw, so, yeah. I saw that you, uh, they're uh, highlighting a airbag for motorcycles. That looked pretty sweet. It was cool. They did a uh, in-person review of this. They pulled they pulled the uh, the ripcord on this wearable uh, airbag, and this guy got in, ensconced in a wearable airbag. There you go. There's some new new SAT vocabulary words for those of you who have children who are around 15 or 16 years old. Very nice. What else you got today? Well, considering that we're at a conference, we're going to talk. Starting on the news, there's lots of Google stuff, but then we're going to talk my favorite segment, one of your favorite topics, bullshit you hear at legal conferences. And then we're going to finish with, Guy, what are you reading? All right, Lockwood, hit it. Money makes a and welcome to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing, teaching you how to promote, market, and make fat stacks for your legal practice here on Legal Talk Network. All right, everyone, welcome to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. We have got a healthy dose of the news, and we're going to kind of newsjack this and go off on a tangent because there's so much to talk about and unpack in our news items. <laughs> Hold on. There's another Google Core Algo update that smacked us around the head just yesterday. What's going on with the Google Core update? So, you know, we're search nerds. We always talk about Google stuff and sometimes we get sick of it. But gosh, this week, it's really a googly. There's a lot of googliness going on. Um, first is March 2024 spam update launch. And for folks that are listening that don't know this, you can search for Google search status dashboard. Google reports on some of these updates, um, not all of them, but many of them. And, um, you know, and so keep your eyes peeled because uh, spam updates rolling out. They, they announced it the 5th of March and they say it could take up to two weeks to complete. And then the core update could take up to a month to complete. And so this is Everybody, all the SEOs are anticipating that this is going to be a response to the helpful content issues, the Reddit issues, a lot of this AI generated content stuff showing up in results. TBD, but you know, I'm pulling for Google. I hope they figure this out. Okay. And Guy, can you um give a little more perspective on when they talk about spam? Are we talking about content spam? Are we talking about backlink spam? Are we talking about Review spam? Are we talking about spam and eggs? What's what? What do we know about this? Well, they list some specific uh, spam detection and spam policies. Uh, you can go deep in it. I, I think for me, what I read, they're they, they're hitting a couple that are like not so much. You don't see them so much uh, in legal. I don't think but like this idea of you know, you buy like a medical website to list like online casino content because you want to get the quote unquote domain authority of the, the medical website. So like the domain reputation stuff, they're supposed to be cracking down on that. Um, there are a few others in there, the, you know, the, um, the, the real focus is on this idea of helpful content. And so they, you know, they're saying that they've re they're, this update should reduce about 40% of the unhelpful content. But this is the thing that I always get into because I, you know, I, I think it's funny because on the one hand, we talked about this last time, I think, but I guess it comes up again. 
on the one hand, they're, they're, they're licensing this API data from Reddit. Reddit's supposed to have all this helpful content that they're training their uh, algorithms to learn. Uh, and they're trying to get rid of all this unhelpful content. And, and they specifically call out content that's designed for clicks, so clickbait content. But ironically, their system, at least, is training on or they're learning about how to improve their systems based on whether content's getting clicked on or not. So they're like, stop creating clickbaity content. Uh, and yet we are training the algorithm on content that is generating clicks or it's likelihood to generate clicks. So I don't know. I, that's why I was, I was on a thread and I was like, I think that they've just, there's they're bro It's all broken. They don't know what to do. And they are it's all broken. I don't know. I don't Notably know missing in the spam update is anything about review spam. No review spam I in this one. Was... Yeah. And, you know, and I'm like, okay, so what's the tactical thing here? Go remove unhelpful content from your website. And, and we joke because if I if you go do a search right now and lawyers that are on top of this that are, have do these searches, I promise you that nothing's not much is changing right now. You're, there's still plenty of websites that have all sorts of unhelpful content that are ranking. And so... You know, let's let's bookmark this for a month. Let's talk. Let's come back. It's we're recording on March six, so uh, April six, April seventh, somewhere around there. That's when it should fully roll out, and we'll revisit this and see if we notice any differences. All right. There was also an LSA update mid February that I found to be completely and utterly disgusting, yet entirely predictable. The update from Google with LSAs was a rollout where you can now bid on your brand. And Google automatically enrolled everyone doing LSAs in this, which means that if someone types in Smith & Jones, looking for Smith & Jones, your LSA ad can show up for that, even though they were already looking for you. And you can pay for the privilege of having a strong brand like that. Um, Google's been doing this in pay-per-click for a long time, uh, which I find gross. And they're deliberately conflating. For example, I use the obvious example, Morgan & Morgan with Car Accident Lawyer. And that basically increases the number of people who are bidding on those discrete terms, which increases the cost overall in the market. And it's gross. It's really gross. And for them to now roll this out into LSAs is even worse. I think the thing that really pisses me, well, there's lots of things that really piss me off about this, but um, with pay-per-click, you can actually see what's happening. You can see what you can, you can separate out. You've heard from us over and over again that you need to separate out your brand campaigns from your non-branded campaigns. You've, that should not be a surprise to any long-term listeners. But with LSAs, you don't get that data. The opacity in this is really, really concerning. You have no idea how much you're paying for that call that was looking for Smith & Jones to start out with. And so there's really nothing to do. Guy, are you... What has been your strategy with this? Are you opting your clients out? Are you keeping your clients in? Are you just kind of in a wait and see? What, what does that look like for you? So for, for clients that have a, a well-established brand, they're getting a lot of search, uh, I would opt out. Um, you know, I, I, and I, I say this, I hate painting with broad brushes because test it on your own stuff. Test, see, you know, if you're, if it's, if something's happening, that because the, the other side of this coin might be, and to your point, we don't have transparency on this. But what happens if having being opted into the brand thing improves your visibility for the non brand? Then maybe it's worth paying for those leads, even though you are paying on your brand name and, and it stinks. And I agree with you. And I, I think it's gross too. And I don't like it. But what happens if turning it off? Google says, okay, well, you turned that off and so you're you're getting less volume and so we're going to start showing your, you're, you're not booking as many leads, you're not booking as many uh, appointments through the platform, so maybe we don't show you for non-brand queries, in which case I would say it's probably worth, you know, I, I don't know, it depends on your, what your cost per lead is, but if you're caught, if you're a big, if you're a big brand, you know, you talk about Morgan, Morgan's probably like, the more the merrier. Bring it on, hundred bucks a lead on searches on my name. Um, you know they're probably bidding on their own brand name anyway in, in pay per click, and so this is probably cheaper than what sure. they're paying for in pay per click, <laughs> because they're only paying per lead versus paying per click. Uh, but if you're a small budget, you know if, if LSAs is your only advertising and 
you're getting a disproportionate number of you've got an established brand. And 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 to your point, a, a good practice here would be bid on your name so that you can actually see what the relative volumes and, and costs are. And then you can compare your Google ads brand campaign to LSAs. And maybe you can make some correlation there of like, oh, you know, we're actually paying less for brand search and LSAs than we are in pay-per-click. But I think that, I think if I had to paint a broad brush, I would say opt out of it. I, I don't typically, I don't think it's worth it to be buying your own brand name back. That's something that a lot of the, you know, uh, I remember when major sites that I won't name used to do this, they would huh. arbitrage, they would arbitrage on. Does it rhyme with Bravo? Uh, one of them did. Yes, it did. <laughs> um, but uh, we didn't mention this. You can opt out, right? So if you've got LSAs running, run over to your uh, dashboard right now and you can, we'll put a link in the uh, show notes, but yeah, you can opt out of it. But again, you know, if you, if you do that, if you've been humming along before this, and then you you opt out, and then all of a sudden your impressions and LSAs goes to zero. You might think, hey, maybe I just killed my LSAs by opting out. I don't know. What are but you telling? You what are you telling know. people? That's my the whole thing that pisses me off is you don't know. It's such a fucking guessing game, right? It really is. But that's it's not so hard. That's not very helpful for our listeners. Hate the player, <laughs> hate the game, all of it. No, so so bluntly, we're actually doing the opposite. We're keeping people in. Okay. Um, I am I am making the potentially fallacious assumption that the cost for your brand queries is lower than the cost for a transactional term. I don't know that I'm right about that at yeah, all. Yeah, I, I have no clue assume because that. we don't have any data. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. I don't I don't know that. But e but but having said that, my worst case scenario is someone is looking for Smith and Jones and they wind up somewhere else. And and that all the work that you've done to generate that referral, who then bets you online gets lost because you go somewhere else. That is a that is a fear. Having said that, we have clients who spend five figures on their brand. Right. On their brand and just in pay-per-click. Right. Right. And so, all right, you're big, you're big brand advertiser. You you should expect that. Is that fifteen, twenty thousand dollars? Worth it. Have you retained a case that you would have otherwise lost? I, 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 I don't know. And that's right? the thing. People get um, all mad at us and we're like, what do you want us to do? I, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Key, it's your fault. Um, it's, it's just gross. It is a gross move by Google to extract rent out of people who have spent a lot of money building a brand. And I hate it. It's also so messed up too, because you know they and they just updated their uh, quality rater guidelines too, which is, that should be another news item. But they, um, if you follow the quality rater guideline stuff, and you should, uh, they just you know they've been adding all of this uh, and, and documentation on their uh, spam updates. You know they're trying to actively remove from the results these spammers that are trying to trade on other people's names organically, but in ads. It's no problem. We don't care in ads if you are trading out other people's names because that's where we make our money. Mess. Yeah. It's messed. Uh, right. Anyway, the other thing I want to, so, I, before we move on, is you made some really yeah. you made a really are I you, want you I want you to slow down and talk okay. to and talk to people about branded PPC. Oh. So, so let me let me let me set it up for you and then you can okay. take take off. So because you already Slow said pitch this. over the plate, please. Yeah, well, I think this is important because this is the tactical part of it. So even if you, let's say you're like, look, I don't want to bid on my competitor's names. I want to do, you know, car accident lawyer. So I'm exact matching car accident lawyer. And this is Google ads. Not We're not talking about LSAs here because you can't do that in LSAs, obviously. Um, talk to us about what the problem is. And so there's this, uh, I'll, I'll even take it one step further. So there's a so people are thinking, oh, well, I'm just I'm only exact matching car accident attorneys. So I'm not bidding on my competitors names. Conrad, what's wrong with that? And what else can lawyers do to avoid bidding on their or their ad showing for on competitors names? So the big problem with this is the conflation of exact match terms with branded queries. And the right. example we use over and over again is Morgan and Morgan and car accident lawyer are synonymous in the eyes of Google. Yeah. Now, so, so let me just, know, the, let me, let this, me say the, this let me say the buzzword. Never the case before. Yeah. The go. buzzword here is close variant, right? So even with an exact match term, Google will show your ad if Google deems that your exact match search term 
is a close variant to a branded search term like Morgan & Morgan. Is there anything you can do about this, Conrad? Yes, there is. And this is why, so I, I used to really encourage people to do it yourself on pay-per-click in many cases. This has now become so convoluted and difficult to do that I, I actually would make an aggressive case that hiring a really good agency to handle this is the right answer. And I'll tell you why, it, and, and it's just part of this. So Guy, the only way to really deal with this is to have massive negative keyword lists for your competitors. And a negative keyword basically says, if Morgan & Morgan gets searched, I don't ever want my ads to show up for Morgan & Morgan. You can imagine how complicated that might get. How many agencies do you think are actually doing that? Well, and the problem is Google is, is their rec this is even worse. It's more nefarious than it sounds because their recommendations are to help you spend more money. And they, and they name these things, these, these recommendations to make it sound like you're getting more when you're really, really getting less. So the agencies that don't really know what they're doing are getting, are getting fucked up with this. The lawyers who are trying to do it themselves are getting fucked up with this. And when you, when you have an inefficient campaign, it doesn't just impact you, it impacts the entire market because it's an open bidding system and it screws everybody. And Google's making a ton of money by screwing the industry. The end, goodbye, I'm sorry. We need to come up with something happier to talk about right now. Well, we have a lot of happy things to talk about, but first, let's take a quick break. Hey, are you enjoying this on YouTube? Uh, we'd love to keep the conversation going. Please leave us a comment. Don't forget to subscribe if you're enjoying this episode. And on the topic of Google, uh, please check out our rising costs of Google ads and traffic for traffic sake episode that we'll leave in the description to this video. So hope to see you on YouTube. All right, Guy, we're now going to go into our segment. We've talked about this before, but the bullshit you hear at legal conferences, and I'm sitting here in beautiful Savannah. I'm as soon as we finish recording, I'm going to go off and talk to a bunch of motorcycle accident attorneys. And you, you take some umbrage with this concept, don't you? Well, no, I don't take umbrage with the, with the concept of conferences. I, you know, I think, okay. and we've talked about conferences before. We've been doing this a long right. time. You and I have spoke at many conferences. In fact, we, sure. used, to, we used to put on a conference together. Oh, yeah. um, I was the, I'm the former chair of tech show. So we've been around the conference world. It's not like you know, this, I don't want this to come across as like sour grapes. But but my, but the really and this came out of a, a part of we've had this discussion many times but it came out of a Facebook post uh, where you said you were hearing some things at the conference and we're we're going to get into the specific things that you're hearing that that you might have issue with but sure um, you know what happened was he, he opened this conversation up about conferences doing a better job of vetting speakers and, and I don't know what the solution is but you know I, com conference after conference we hear people on stage saying stuff that we're like, I can't believe they're saying that. And to me, one of the issues is, is that the conference, you know, conference organizers should do a better job of vetting speakers and they should be more transparent about the economics of how the conference works because many of these speakers are paying to speak. And again, I don't have an issue with paying to speak, but let the audience know because when I go to buy a ticket, I want to know, is this a sponsored content piece or is this a, you know, this person's there because you're a curated expert on the topic. And again, I'm not opposed to it. I don't, I don't have a problem with it. I don't have a problem with sponsorships and, and paid content, but go look what the FTC says about native advertising. I mean, essentially, if you tell me this, if you get, if you pay to get up on a stage, is that not a native ad? How's it not a native ad? So you're taking FTC concerns to the pod. Well, I, you know, the FTC, I think the FTC is a totally different topic, but I, I'm just, there's some people that seem to think like, who cares? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter with the, who's paying who for what. And I'm like, of course it does. Of course it matters. Who's paying who for so what? When you say there are some people, you were talking about the conference putter honors who are profiting from agencies. It's usually agents. If you're if you're a marketing person at a conference at this point in time and it's not tech show, is is your my default is that person is paying to pitch. Fair? Too too broad brush? Well, I, I think it's it's more and more common, which I think is why it's more and more on our radar. Um, okay. but but no, I don't think that's 
and and again, even let's just say it is. Let's just say every then just disclose it. Just put it out. Okay. Let the attendees know. Hey, this is a sponsored session. This is a paid for session. The problem is, is that they're misleading people because people are, you know, the lawyers are coming to these conferences. They think, oh, this conference organizer is just getting the best people around to okay. come speak on this topic. And it's like, well, maybe, but maybe the best person didn't want to pay the $25,000 freight. Yeah. So my my bigger concern, I the disclosure part, I, I hear you. I don't care as much about And by the way, and I'll be fully upfront on this, I pay a shitload of money to speak at conferences. And 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 I, and I've been bummed that I haven't seen you at a lot of them because I know we kind of live on on philosophical different different sides of this. But Not really. I don't I don't I'm not against you paying. I don't no, have no, a problem no, 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 with but, you paying. But you won't do it. You're standing on a bigger you're a more principled person than I am. Well, not even that. I I would just say this, for me, if I, you know, if I'm going to go and I'm going to sponsor a uh, a uh, you know, a speaking thing, like I'm going to I'm going to yeah. pay to speak. Then I think it's important that the conference is like, "Hey, this is Guy. He's sponsor yeah. Attorney Sync is sponsoring this session." That's all I care about. Okay. Okay. I my biggest problem with all of this is the bullshit content that is being delivered at these conferences to people who are paying to get good content, whether it's poor vetting or just the prostitution of the speakers. But they're con that's right? connected. Like, Those are connected things. No, I, 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 okay. I get it. I, I right. get your point that they're connected. I just I feel like the the real you're you're solving the bad content problem through disclosure. I don't think that is going to change the bad content problem. You're still going to get people bluntly who have no business speaking about some of the things that they talk about at some of these conferences. And disclosure doesn't help that. I've just I've I don't think. I don't think the conference hosts are doing a good job to think about, are these people really thought leaders in their business? And that, whether they're paying or not, is really, really problematic. Yeah, I, I mean- I, And it's gross. Yeah, I think, uh, I, yes, I don't think that the uh, disclosure solves the problem, but it helps the audience give a weight uh, to what they're hearing. Uh, also, we'd like to give a shout to uh, Mike Mogul. He uh, dropped an episode uh, on his podcast about the realities of legal conferences today. So go check that out. We'll put that in the show notes. Um, again, well, let's for, let's not keep beating this dead horse. Let's go into okay. what have you recently well, heard at a legal conference that... We're going to go into three examples okay. from very recent history. One might not even call it history. And I would love to get your feedback on this because for two reasons. Number one, it, we're making the point that some of the content that you get at these conferences is absolutely off. Number two, I want to start dispelling some of this these concepts that you guys are hearing at places like conferences because it's problematic. <laughs> okay, so from a and, and by the way, I, I I sent these three things to our VP of of SEO because I wanted to make sure that Conrad wasn't out of step. And Kevin, in his typical fashion, and in his gruff voice, said, "I wouldn't agree with any of these things." Um, but so, so I, now that I've set that up, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you these questions, Guy, and I would like you to dispel now that now that we've kind of suggested, or, may, or maybe you disagree with Kevin, but I'm gonna give you three things that I want you to respond to, and hopefully, the audience is gonna take away not just that we are suspicious of conferences in general, but like I do think these are some items that you really should not be thinking about tactically. All right, number one. In order to rank for transactional queries, head terms like motorcycle accident lawyer, you need to start by getting five to 10,000 sessions a month for informational queries, like how to put on your motorcycle helmet. True or false, Guy? Well, uh, that's... <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just, to, just to frame, uh, there, you're saying you can't rank for transactional queries without first ranking for informational queries? Well, because Google likes that, Guy. Uh, I think, I th so uh, that's false. Um, now, okay. now, if I wanted to be a judicious listener, do ranking, does ranking for informational queries correlate with ranking for transactional queries? Probably, 
because, you know, as your site gets more authority, you probably see that you're ranking for, across a broader of the four types of search intents. Uh, you know, classically, people would say like navigational, informational, commercial, and transactional. And so you probably see that. But, you know, I've never seen a situation where you have to, and especially if there's a specific number of <laughs> sessions being implied. Um, oh, and first of all, the, the only place that you'd actually be able to see this would be in Search Console because you're not seeing this from GA4, which, which is technically is where sessions come from. I don't, I don't right. even know if we call what's going on in Search Console sessions, so to speak. But um, no, you don't. There's no like thresh. I've never seen that there's a threshold for one search intent to in order to rank for another search intent. And listeners, you already fucking know this right. because if this was the case, you would read all of your content on Amazon, which does more transactions than anybody else. And Wikipedia would be selling motorcycle helmets and microphones and mousetraps, right? Which it's not. So right. you already know this. Take, right. put some common sense in here. Okay, that was number one. The number two is very, very tightly related to this, but I wanna, I wanna give you your opportunity to respond to this. Traffic is the, capital V, SEO KPI. The primary SEO KPI you should look at is traffic. True or false, Guy? Sure, for the New York Times, sure. Ah. But for, okay. for a law firm? No, not even, I mean, tra traffic, traffic? You want some traffic? <laughs> I mean, you can rank for, you can get some traffic all sorts of different ways. You want to rank for Detroit Lions, you could rank for some you know, random search query that uh, has nothing to do with the practice of law. You know, you could do, you could break one of these, um, you could buy this medical domain and, and post a bunch of content, generate all sorts of traffic that's never going to convert into a single potential client inquiry, let alone a client inquiry. And so I, you know, traffic, in, relevant traffic, the growth of relevant traffic is a good leading indicator. It's no way close to the ultimate SEO KPI. Okay. I, I could not agree more. Um, I, I, this is, and I can share this cause I'm pretty certain these guys don't listen to the podcast and I won't share who it is, but we're looking at a firm right now that has seen a massive spike in traffic. Um, they're doing, this is a law firm. They are really killing it for Brooklyn style pizza, which I didn't even know was a thing, but boy, oh boy, are people looking for it and landing on some content about Brooklyn style pizza. Maybe they right? should start selling um, ads to Brooklyn pizza joints. Well, we, so like, this is, it's funny you say that. Uh, so this is going to go tangent, but like, part of me is like, okay, you're winning that game. That's an asset. How can we leverage that? Right? Like, what can we do with that? So can we profile, like, yes, I do think these things through a little bit further, but like the reality is their phone's not ringing from Brooklyn style pizza. Here's okay? a question for and, you. Has, uh, this is yeah. another, ta another tangent. Have they attracted any links because of it? Ah, to Brooklyn style pizza. I don't believe so. So. Well, okay, so let's, so great question. So let me ask you this question, and I think I know your answer. If you have something that is completely unrelated, so for example, if you happen to sponsor a- uh, Conference? Adopt a puppy, a conference, <laughs> right? right. Um, if you had something that was a non-head term and you had content on that and it got a link, right? Let's, let's say it's completely, it's an adopt a puppy thing and you get a link from that. From where? Relevant? Where'd you Good. get a link from? Uh, uh, you get a link from the local, local animal, sh news... animal shelter. Local local animal shelter uh, about about why you should adopt puppies. And you I get like a link it. from there. I still like I it. I like it too. Yeah. Why do you? So so I knew that was going to be your answer. For our dear listeners who are not so steeped in the intricacies of SEO, gee, why do you like it? Uh, it's it's locally relevant. Um, you might even drive some traffic from it. You might drive um, some other like local interest. I mean, these I think these. Uh, anyway, I, I'm big on the local links. I mean, the uh, to me that's the thing that over and over again that I keep seeing. If you find ways to get businesses, organizations, schools, blah blah blah, in your local community. Um, it also is great from a, you know, you're highlighting that your good works in the community stuff. So even outside the SEO context, I think it's a good thing. And I, that's the thing too, is I think that, you know, SEO people like us, we get so hyper-focused on, uh, some of these, you know, wrong metrics 
Like that's great. And the same thing we we talk about the the other thing I always think about is like scholarships. So scholarships got abused. Everybody's trying to get your links from .dot edu's, but there's a law from here in Southeast Michigan that um, they sponsor three different scholarships. One is for it's a go to law school scholarship. One's for injury crash survivors, and it gets picked up in the news and it gets it's great PR for the firm and it attracts a bunch of links from local organizations and education organizations for people that want scholarships. That's a great way to do the scholarships. Great. Yep. Yep. All, and I they could rank. Not, they rank all over more. the place. So for those of you who are brand new to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing, if you go back and listen to old episodes, this is a concept that is going to come back over and over again. Local links. And by the way, and this is another tangent. Sorry, we're on tangent heaven here. Um, your DR, those DR ratings are not going to pick Ooh. up the value of a local link. Did you just barf when I said I DR? Did. DR? I did. You said DR. I, DR. I'm so tired. Of, I'm so tired of it. So exhausting. Right. I mean, I just got, it was just funny because I was just got like five <laughs> emails today about like rocket boost DR 70 backlinks. Yep. And I'm like, oh, still thing. Rocket boost. Okay. Final question for you, sir, because yes, sir. this did not sit well with me. You have to carefully select your SEO company who can balance tactics because some tactics hurt organic while helping local. There are tactics that you can do that work against local or organic at the same time. Can you come up with me, Guy, of a single digital marketing tactic that you would use that would hurt organic in favor of local or vice versa? Oh, so you didn't give me vice versa before, so I didn't prep for that one. But uh, let me, I was really trying to rack my brain. I mean, the short answer is no, but if you really wanted to stretch, maybe you could say something like, you know, you could buy fake reviews that would help your local, but those fake reviews could, um, you know, potentially, because there are, there's, there's arguably, if you were using the fake reviews as part of your structured data on your site and you were violating the self-serving ads thing and you got a manual action for the fake reviews on your structured data. Wow. On your okay. <laughs> so you're going to manual I'm action creative, to come man. up with an example. I'm creative. All right. I like it. I'm a creative like guy. It. And I'm, I want to be a judicious <clears throat> listener. I think the other thing that, that I thought m when we talked about this before, maybe would be something to do with the how you're using URLs, um, the URLs you're using in your Google business profile versus the URLs you're trying to rank organically. Your your structure of your URLs could arguably help you in local and hurt you in traditional. But gosh, other than that, I just, I really couldn't think Are of Are we one. stretching? Oh yeah, we're, yeah. we're way out in Okay, okay. So la -la my, my point here, the goosh, so to speak, is... Local and organic, while the tactics are, there is some overlap in some of the tactics, they are reinforcing. They're not oppositional. And yeah, right. I mean, it's, go look at the, go look at the, what the ranking factors are for local. I mean, it says right in there, traditional SEO <laughs> right. factors, <laughs> right. impact prominence, They're, which is the major factor in local. So, you know, um, and you know, the thing I always think about when we talk about this kind of stuff, like, I know what you're going to say, but I always, I always, maybe I'm too philosophical, like. Maybe some of the people that are talking about this, they actually believe it. Do you think they believe it? Do you think they believe these things or do they think that they're just really just shilling for the crowd? Um, I think it's both. I think there are some people who just genuinely don't know. And I think there is some deliberate subterfuge. And I, I believe it is the onus is on the conference hosts to sift through the more, do more bullshit sifting um, and not just happily cash the checks. And now, now I'm going to get myself uninvited, but same. Don't uh, worry. That's why you don't see me around. All uh, you do is just pay more, man. <laughs> You'll be at every one of these conferences. Just keep paying. <laughs> I do like, you like, can say whatever I, you want. I, so full disclosure to the listeners, I have a six figure budget for conference speaking this year. And, and it is bigger than it was last year. Uh, Cause it's great. I, I I know that may it, it it I feel like I'm telling a dirty secret to you, Guy. I feel like this is a confessional, not a podcast. Yeah, this is what right. it is. This is our confessions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move away from my Catholic school uh, history lesson. Um, we're gonna take a break. When we come back, Guy and I have an amazing, exciting announcement for you. Stay tuned. Listen up. 
lunch hour legal marketing lovers. We you need some more lunch hour legal marketing in your life. Conrad and I are going to be hosting office hours. March 15th will be our first crack at this. So uh, head over to LinkedIn because we're going to be uh, communicating the logistics and how to sign up and topics and that stuff over on the Lunch Hour Legal Marketing LinkedIn page. So follow us there for more details. But we're super excited. We're going to go deep. We're going to uh, take specific questions. We're going to solve specific problems. Uh, we're probably going to have some uh, additional guests on there. Uh, Lunch Hour Legal Marketing Office Hours, 315. Mark your calendar. Check it out. And bring your questions. Like, we want this to be live, responsive. You know, Guy and I just kind of talk about this. We're, we're waxing poetic off of the script here. But um, we want to respond in real time to your questions. So if you've got a dumb question or a brilliant question for legal marketing, come join us. Uh, looking forward to it. All right, Conrad. Well, we've been ranting and raving. What are you reading? Uh, you know, I I picked up just kind of at a whim. I've been doing a lot of flights recently because I keep paying to go to all these conferences. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just sad but true. Uh, I picked up Shoe Dog, which is an uh, autobiography um, by Phil Knight. It's his memoir, and he goes into his experiences in the 60s and 70s creating this amazing brand. And the reason I love this is it shows just how messy it was creating this business. And I think we have this misperspective that those really successful businesses have, you know, they've got it all worked out. It was a master plan drawn up in some corporate strategy session that was executed against flawlessly. Um it is, you know, this it's 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 brilliant. And I think the reason it's brilliant is because it just shows how messy it was for Nike to build Nike. Um, and it's the same thing for us building our agencies. Key. I mean, you and I deal with stupid stuff all the time. There's messes that we have to deal with on the regular. Same with law firms. I thought um, I did an interview with Christopher early the other day. And he was talking about how it just gets harder and more complicated. You never get to a point where it's easy. He's just continuing to get better all the time. And that's really the mindset. I, it, it really puts to bed this perspective that it, it's kind of this neat plan that was, was, was foretold, obviously, and easily. And so it's a, and it's also a really, really interesting read. Phil Knight used to drink a lot, by the way. That was one of the things that I was my biggest surprise. I mean, he was a, a an Oregon runner, but boy, oh boy, he talks about being hammered in Japan a lot in the book. That was a that was unexpected. Anyway, Guy, what are you reading? Uh, I'm in the process of reading um, everything Tiago Forte that I can get my hands on. And uh, for folks that are familiar with his work, uh, the books are Building a Second Brain and The Para Method. And speaking of messes, uh, part of what he's talking about is uh, how to capture and utilize and apply in a productive way all of the digital information that you touch and learn about across everything. And I, th I do think that this has been a, a really interesting thing for me. You know, uh, we've tried many different methods. You know, we've, we've tried different capture tools. Uh, but I think that Tiago might have a, uh, he claims to have a proven method to organize your digital life and unlock creative potential. Uh, so I'm not done with it yet, but um, I've so far from what I've read and some of the videos, he's also got some courses that I think are worth checking out. So I encourage folks to check that out. All right. Well, I am off to go speak on a panel for which I paid the privilege, but I will tell you this, Guy, do you know Byron Brown? Byron Brown. Byron Brown is the, I've used him a lot in, as an example. He is the anti-lawyer lawyer. I believe he's out of Utah. He's done some amazing uh, yes. branding and positioning. Yes, if yes, you yes. want to really get your creative brain going, uh, check out the anti-lawyer lawyer, lawyer uh, Byron Brown. I have never met this guy before. He's been, hero's a little bit of a stretch, but it's not too far off of mine from a branding and positioning perspective in the legal world. So I, I'm, I'm going to go sit on a panel with him. I'm really looking forward to it. Well, tell the people the truth, Conrad, and enjoy the rest of the conference. And to you listeners, thank you so much for struggling through another episode of Conrad and I 
burning everything down. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please do subscribe to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. Check us out on YouTube. Head over to LinkedIn and follow the page so you can join our office hours and get your specific problem solved. Until next time, Conrad and Gee signing off for Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. Money makes a money makes a it makes a world go round. Money makes a world go round. Money makes a world go round. Money makes a world go round. Yeah, money makes a world go